Okay, we're live. Well, good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, June 2nd, 2020 Board of Selections meeting. We are Zoom uh, broadcasting tonight once again. Thank you all for joining. Uh, tonight's uh, business starts with Municipal Officers Workshop Business and our public hearings. So the first being a the fiscal 21 town meeting and budget informational hearing. John. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, this evening uh, we have the first of three informational meetings over the next uh, regular uh, scheduled board of selectmen uh, sessions on the FY21 budget and town meeting warrant, warrant articles. Monday, we filmed a promotional video uh, that we'd like to present at this time that uh, we'll see how uh, people like it and it goes through the budget and the warrant articles. John, you ready for me to show it? Yes. Please. All right. Well, hello, fellow residents of the town of Wells. Um, Mike Livingston, the town engineer and planner. And this is our annual video we do for informational purposes for the upcoming town warrant. Uh, that'll be occurring on July 14th. Uh, we'd like to start off. The purpose of this meeting, of course, is to, to provide the public with background information on the articles they'll be voting on at the town meeting. And uh, we try to cover most of the articles in this informational session, uh, but we do try to keep it brief to keep your, your attention and get the information across to everyone as much as possible. Uh, so the first item on the agenda is uh, the budget, which is a critical item in the that you'll all be voting on and I'll turn it over to John and Jody. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm John Carter, town manager, and in a few days, uh, you'll be receiving the town meeting book. It looks like this in the mail. Uh, we are with the Board of Selectmen having three informal uh, hearings on the budget uh, and the warrant articles associated with that. Uh, it is a process that we undergo from early uh, fall through uh, March. And I'm going to turn it over to Jody, our finance director, to kind of describe the process. So back in December, department heads produced their budget. The town manager and I um, took all that information that was submitted by department heads, compiled it into a budget that we then presented to the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen, once they accept that budget, turn it over to the Budget Committee. The Budget Committee started meetings in the first week of January, and we just finished with the Budget Committee just recently. But um, part of the task of the Budget Committee is to make sure that we present to back to the Selectmen and to the voters a budget that is under LD1, which is the tax cap that we have to follow and the budget that we have proposed is meeting that goal. We are under the tax cap by almost $175,000. This is all processed through our town charter and is regulated by that. Um, our budget process has produced a, a budget for FY21 which starts July 1st and the budget is um, is divided in the book. So you can see revenues, uh, salaries, operations, capital improvements, and the uh, standard warrant articles that are passed through and are uh, part of the capital improvement uh, project uh, program. Um, on salaries, we are up uh, two to four percent. We are in negotiations with uh, four labor groups and we have finalized one contract and we have three other contracts as of today, June 1st to resolve. Uh, we are making good progress there. The gross operating uh, budget is up. Uh, that is because of our debt financing and uh, uh, benefits and other insurances. Um, we have warrant articles that are up 
for the purpose of buying conservation lands, which we'll be getting into in a minute. And our capital improvement plan is down by almost 22%. Revenues are a little bit off this year, uh, but they are still very healthy. Uh, even in the COVID-19 uh, era, we believe we're closing FY20 in the black. Um, as we speak June 1st, it looks that way. Um, in FY21, July 1st, we will be um, watching the first quarter uh, as well as the second quarter and putting some funds aside, just making sure um, in that uh, situation that revenues are coming in and that we won't be making those expenditures uh, until we see the revenue picture and, and how healthy we are as a community. Um, so, our budget um, is, is locked in place. We are looking at a July 14th uh, special um, town meeting in the sense that it was moved from June 9th by the governor to July 14th because of the COVID-19. And uh, it will be at the junior high. We urge people to do absentee voting um, at at uh, request absentee ballots. Uh, and you can do that from our website under the town clerk page or by calling the town clerk or contacting the secretary of state for an absentee ballot. So Jody, um, um, what other important uh, data points that you see with the budget? So, um in our proposed budget, um, taxpayers will see that we're looking at a school tax increase of approximately 1.28%. Um, the tax rate that we're presenting in the budget is based on a 1% increase in valuation. Uh, we won't know what our valuation is until the assessor is through with her spring pickup, which will happen later this um, summer. Um, but currently, if we only pick up the 1% in tax valuation, we're looking at a tax rate of $3.56 on the municipal side, um, which would be up 29 cents from last year. And then we want to note that our budget does include some key things. Um, in the CIP project, there's um, some equipment that we need to purchase. And then we also have a bond that's on this year's Warren article that we'll be asking you to vote um, to allow us to go to bond. So that is one of the biggest items on the budget. And we'll be talking about that in a moment. Great, and uh, for the voters, uh, the, all the budgetary articles are articles three through 13, um, that'll be on the town warrant and the ballot. Uh, articles 15, uh, 14, 15, and 16 are regarding the conservation land acquisitions that John had referenced earlier. And uh, we have Keith Fletcher from the Conservation Commission that's available here at the meeting as well to discuss those items. All three involve the land acquisitions of conservation lands. So Keith, can you describe each of those to us? I sure will. Thank you very much. Uh, so articles 14, 15, and 16 come from the Conservation Commission and carry on a, a tradition in the town of Wells of purchasing some land and setting it aside for conservation, both for wildlife and for people to enjoy, to protect water quality and um, kind of keep some of the rural character here in Maine, the beautiful town we are in. So article 14 is a uh, conservation land purchase. This piece of land is between Meeting House Road and Route 109. Uh, although the Warren article says 60 acres, we've had some survey work done. We believe it to be 74 acres. This tract of land will be accessed, not now, but in the future by the public from the Eastern Trail, which we expect to come through in about, I don't know, five to 10 years through that area. So right now it's off a private road. We're not encouraging people to go down a private road, but it is an important <laughs> conservation piece. 
Uh, and to help the town afford this uh, parcel of land, uh, we did. We were successful in obtaining two large sums of money. One was a $120,000 grant from the Maine Natural Resources Conservation Program, and the other was a $70,000 bargain sale by the landowner, who in that way gave the first gift. So this is uh, beautiful land. It's wooded wetlands. Um, uh, lovely for wildlife. It's very important as a stopping point for especially large animals moving between conservation areas to the south and west up to Kennebank Plains and back. We know black bear move through here, moose, all sorts of critters use this land. So the town, uh, we're, we're requesting $120,000 from the land bank, which is a capital improvement fund uh, for this purpose. Uh, which would add on to the $190,000 and other funds that were raised uh, and result in acquisition of, of this, this parcel of land uh, uh, for conservation. Um, the, the next one, Article 15, is an important addition to the Fenders and Wildlife Commons, which is a large wetland that is mostly in town ownership now, it protects water quality in the Maryland River and Eaton Brook and uh, helps protect, protect water quality in wells and so forth uh, and is also favored by hunters. And this would improve access to that backland there um, off of Bald Hill Road and would also protect stream frontage along Eaton Brook. It's a very beautiful piece of land and uh, we will be getting that at a very good price. And for that, we are requesting 144,000 from the land bank, that capital improvement fund I mentioned earlier, um, to acquire that. And uh, that would, again, improve access. And it's also just great habitat, beautiful, beautiful land in there. And last is Article 16, which has been planned for a while. This is a six acre addition to the Getchell um, um, wildlife commons per, that the town purchased uh, several years ago. Uh, a really interesting piece of land that it is, uh, over 130 acres. It has a uh, very diverse habitat, uh, meadows, scrubs, shrub wetlands, uh, scrubby lands, old farm uh, foundations, things like that. Interesting piece of land. But what this would do is really improve access to that land, which is uh, the current access is on a road, but it's very wet. So this is nice high dry access. This six acres um, is also used currently by folks who train uh, bird dogs. There's a nice course set up for training uh, bird dogs for hunting and for pheasants. So uh, this, this as part of that, we will be working with the Bragdon Estate um, also to give them a right of way over a strip of town land that will improve their ability to manage their land off Route 9. And so you'll see that um, in the second part of the article's description. But um, so we hope with this six acres, uh, besides the fact that it's a lovely field, uh, nice in its own right, it's, it's great legal access to, to Getchell Pasture and enable people to cross um, crossover into that wildlife commons. And for that, we're asking $82,000, although we think we can bring it in a little less than that because the survey costs will not be as high as we um, first thought. So we hope, uh, they're all great projects. I hope you support them. They all got unanimous votes in favor from both the select board and the budget committee. Um, please support the work of the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Keith. Um, and. If people want to know where the exact location of those properties are in, a, in the appendix of the uh, booklet you'll get in the mail, appendix one, two, and three, uh, show the locations of each of those parcels. Thank you, Mike. Um, the next article to be discussed is article 17, which is the road bond issue and seawall bond issue. And I'll turn over that discussion to Carrie, Carol Murrow. Thanks, Mike. Um, it's actually three components. There's roads, there's sea walls and also a bridge. Um, all, all of these items are critical pieces of infrastructure that need some attention. I'll tackle the roads first and then Jim Hall from Dubon King is also here 
and we'll talk more about the bridges and seawalls with Jim. He's a structural engineer, but he does speak English, not just engineering. So I think you'll find he's informative. Swamp John Road, as you're all aware, has um, been in a bad state of disrepair, maybe never a good state of repair. Um, and quite frankly, the only way to fix it is to go back down to the bottom of the road and rebuild it from ground level back up. And unless you get water out from underneath the pavement and get good material under the pavement, you'll never keep a road. So that, that's why this project seems very expensive. It is, but it's a one-time fix, and then you have a road that's gonna be there for seven to probably 11 years with, with nothing being done, and then only minor crack filling and that sort of maintenance. A million dollars seems like a lot, but there is a lot of traffic on that road. It's not just people that live on the road, and it's not just gravel trucks. It's constant traffic. This will fix it correctly, and as I said, we can, we can say it's been done, and you'll have a good road to travel on for a substantial amount of time with only minor maintenance in the future. Robinson Road and Pine Ledge Road um, were accepted by the town when the development was done. Unfortunately, as is typical back in that era, the drainage was not designed with existing and, and in fact future demands on that system being considered. Those folks that live on that U essentially have lived with road drainage into their basements, into their front yards for a long time. It is so flat and so ledgy that there's really not an easy way to get the drainage collected and, and appropriately dealt with. As we started working on this project, it became pretty clear that it was going to be necessary to collect all the drainage in a retention pond, let Mother Nature do some evaporation from that, but also in high storm times have an overflow mechanism where rainwater could in fact collect and then be discharged to a pond. So that all added to the cost of the project. Um, it's been promised to these folks for a long, long time that live there, as well as those of us that traveled through there. And it's really now time to fix the problem so they can have full enjoyment of their property without the town's water um, compromising that. So yes, that's up over a million dollars. Again, it seems like a lot, but it's the appropriate way to fix the problem so we never have to go back there and do it again except for routine maintenance. We brought Jim Hall on board with Dubon King because I'm, I'm an engineer, but I'm not a structural engineer. And I took Jim on kind of a field trip to go look first at Drake's Island. So Jim, if you want to talk a little bit about that bridge, I'd appreciate it. Sure, no problem. Thanks, Carol. Uh, yeah, the Drake's Island Bridge uh, is routinely spec inspected by the Maine Department of Transportation. And the during the last inspection, they sent a letter of deficiency to the town, stating that there were certain deficiencies in the bridge that needed to be addressed. Um, Carol reached out and asked if we could take a closer look. Uh, on further uh, investigation, uh, we noticed that the timbers are in significantly poor condition, in particular the substructure, which, is, which means that which are the timbers that support the bridge. Uh, the timbers uh, for, that make up the pier, uh, have significant deterioration and have marine borers. Um, in addition to the poor condition of the timber, um, all of the rail uh, on the bridge and the approach rail has either failed or is in the process of failing. Uh, given that these are, are life safety issues, um, uh, you know, there's something that, that needs to be addressed um, immediately. Uh, given the challenging uh, uh, environment and the uh, geometrics of the Drake's Island Bridge, we'd re we've recommended to the town that they completely replace the bridge. Um, it provides a single point of access to Drake's Island, and uh, the construction will be rather complex to uh, you know, maintain traffic. Um, so we'd, we're, we're recommending that they do a, you know, a single, um, uh, as opposed to a rehabilitation at this point. Uh, it makes the most sense for the long-term uh, impacts to the community on Drake's Island to, to replace it um, at this point. So while Jim was here, um, we also took a look at some seawalls. 
We started out at Casino Square. Um, again, I'm not a structural engineer, but I was concerned about the integrity of that seawall. We then looked um, at, at a couple of other walls, one of which is a FEMA project from a year ago in March in that storm. We have an extension to our FEMA grant to bring us through November of this year. So Jim, maybe you could talk a little bit about the seawalls and what you see there. Sure. Uh, I guess to start with, the, uh, the FEMA project is uh, the Crescent Beach uh, wall. There's about a 200 foot section of wall that was severely damaged in a storm event. Um, there is a, it's currently supported by a concrete wall and steel sheet pile uh, system. Uh, the steel sheet pile system uh, that's part of it ha has been co um, com completely damaged, uh, so it's no longer providing any structural capacity to the wall. Uh, this wall system, uh, you know, is immediately supporting uh, Webb Hannett Road, um, so that that section of the wall, you know, really needs to be replaced immediately. Um, the sub-base materials below the road at this point. Um, it's, uh, you know, without a subsurface investigation, it's hard to tell exactly what's supporting the road. Um, so we've recommended that they go, we go in and, and do some uh, soil borings to test, to see exactly what's supporting the road and, you know, and immediately replace the steel sheet piles. Um, so I guess that's the section at, at Crescent. Um, I guess the other areas along Webb Hannett, there are needs significant repair. It, it looks like uh, it's been um, kind of rehabilitated uh, off and on over the years, but uh, you know, there's certain sections that are gonna require um, significant concrete rehabil rehabilitation. Uh, there's large cracks and spalls. Um, and if, uh, while we're out fixing this section that's failed, um, you know, if we, if we patch and seal and chip uh, the, uh, the sections with significant de deterioration, uh, we can extend the service life of, of those remaining pieces of wall. Um, and I guess the last segment was the section at Casino Square. Uh, the, when we looked at the section at Casino Square, um, the section of Casino Square is, is the concrete's in poor condition as well. Uh, there's severe cracking. Uh, there's movement in the wall that's just north of the lookout. Um, it looked like the lookout section had been uh, rehabilitated at some point, but the concrete um, in that section has been, is failing as well. So, uh, you know, we're working currently on, on a cost to replace that, but right now we're looking at proposing maybe a, a, a hybrid of some of it gets rehabilitated and some of it gets replaced, um, but it's in very, very poor condition. Uh, if you go along the beach there, you can see the large concrete spalls. Um, you know, it's, uh, it sees heavy traffic in the summer and uh, it doesn't have an extended service life uh, left in it without a significant rehabilitation or replacement. But having said that, I want to be sure everybody understands that it's safe to travel. Um, if they were in danger of imminent failure, we would be closing the roads or taking other protective measures. Hopefully that helps explain the projects that we're looking for the bond on. And that's just the engineering side. I think John wants to talk a little bit about the financial side of it. So um, the, the cost of uh, doing this work uh, is estimated around $4.5 million. Um, we are in the uh, development uh, planning phase. Uh, we have two engineering costs presently for the road work right. and drainage work. We don't have yet uh, from Mr. Hall uh, coming coming within the next few weeks, cost estimates for the Drake's Island Bridge and the three seawalls. One of the seawalls will be reimbursed by FEMA at 75%, but we have to pay out 100% and wait for the 75 to come to us. And that will possibly include moving utility lines to the opposite side of the street on the uh, Crescent Beach uh, project. We went to uh, the Board of Selectmen and Carl Exted, our chair is with us tonight. And we had um, uh, a discussion with the Board of Selectmen 
they asked Jody to work on the uh, spreadsheet that we put together through their uh, recommendations uh, when we put the public safety complex of looking at 20 years out and taking into account the LD1, the requirement of having 60 to 90 days of operating uh, funds um, and uh, together whether our cash uh, uh, would carry us uh, into the future if we were cash flow into the future if these um, if this 4.5 million dollar bond would um, take place uh, we then uh, and we'll we'll talk briefly on that uh, we then went to our bond council and bond broker and our bond broker has put together a plan where we would do bond anticipation notes to fund the projects and then we right size the bond to be no more than 4.5 or if it's less then it would be less than that. So Carl did you uh, want to say anything on on that? Yeah and first off to, we're, since we're talking about the overall budget uh, I wanted to thank the administration all the department heads and the budget committee for all of the work and effort put in uh, to get us to where we are. Uh, Jody, being the, the keeper of the funds, has done a wonderful job with uh, with Casey Welch, her assistant. And believe me, uh, nobody nobody wants at this stage of the game to be talking about borrowing another four or five million dollars. But as Carol and Jim Hall have uh, said, you know, this these are things that are life safety. They may not be imminent. Uh, dangerous right now, but they, they, this is not going away. Uh, the folks on Pine Ledge uh, I've worked with over the last three years, they've been extremely patient. Um, this is a project that needs to be done. And of course, Swamp John is something that uh, it, it's no longer cut and paste and, and throw some coal patch on it and fix it. This is, this is a road that's heavily traveled that needs to be fixed. So and looking at this from the Board of Selectmen's perspective, all, all five of us are totally in agreement uh, on numbers, if I'm not mistaken, we're, we're going to be around one and a half percent interest rate. And, you know, we with the COVID-19 and the federal government, we only could hope that with the getting in front of this and voting this in now that uh, maybe, just maybe, there's a way for us to get some federal dollars coming back to us. So we're ahead of the curve by doing that. So we wholeheartedly support the 4.5 million. Uh, if it can be less, it will be. But uh, we certainly, for a few months now, ever since the pandemic has hit, we've been asking a lot of questions and Jody's been keeping us informed with the town manager in regards to where we stand financially. Certainly we're all concerned about the budget. Uh, we're gonna be in the black as the town manager has said uh, for this year and we will be watching probably almost on a daily basis in this next budget cycle uh, to see where we stand to make sure that uh, we remain healthy and strong uh, because we've been so ultra conservative over the, the last uh, 20 years probably by putting money away for buying equipment and doing things the way we've done it. Uh, we are financially in pretty good shape versus some other communities. So kudos to Jody and her staff and, and all the administration working collectively together so that we can do things like put land in conservation, which has always been supported by the town. But we still have the ability to do things like that and to keep the people safe. So from the board's perspective, we wholeheartedly support this pro these projects. Well, great. Uh, that's a great discussion on the warrant, uh, the warrant article involving the bond issue. And uh, to wrap things up, I think John might have wanted say a few words about the voting procedure. You already touched upon it earlier, but uh, July 14th is the date. Yeah. Normally we would have voted June 9th, um, but the governor pushed off uh, the, the elections to July 14th. The Board of Selectmen moved the uh, town meeting, the annual town meeting to that date. And uh, we are encouraging people to either do absentee voting uh, or be at the polls, which is at the junior high 
on the 14th from 8 to uh, 8 p.m. Um, and so we are, as I said earlier, mailing out our town meeting booklet uh, the week of June 1st. And that should be in the hands of everyone by the weekend. So thank you very much. Thank you all and stay well. Good. Nicely done. Moving on, we have a COVID-19 update. John, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, we've had a eventful week. Um, we've had an opportunity to meet with the coastal managers uh, from the North Shore through uh, Maine. Uh, we, we are seeing many of the beaches uh, open up, um, phase, uh, two of the governor's plan is moving forward. Uh, the York County managers last Thursday had an opportunity to meet with the governor and her commissioner of economic development. And we uh, listened intently to the governor. Uh, we told her that uh, many different things happened down here in York County and Cumberland County that uh, do not happen in uh, the rest of uh, Maine. And that the density of tourism and the impact of tourism is felt uh, squarely in this part of the uh, state. Uh, she was listening, but she was also indicating that her administration would be making some changes to the quarantine uh, issue. Um, and in fact, uh, we are getting word that there will be some sort of uh, announcement this week on, on the quarantine um, issue that uh, is holding back a lot of people and it continues to be questions upon questions. Um, we also talked to her um, about uh, the outside dining and restaurant issue. And um, she, she hopes that uh, we can uh, facilitate that and be um, uh, helpful to the restaurants in, in getting um, them up and running. Uh, we indicated to her that we were doing what we could to alleviate uh, any regulatory issues from our end. And um, so it was a, um, about an hour and uh, 15 minute uh, Zoom meeting on that. Um, the governor passed, and it will be an agenda item later tonight, um, an order and then a, an amendment to that order on excise tax and some other taxation. Um, on her amendment, she asked the municipalities to set a date in time when um, they expect all the backlog of um, excise of vehicles that were deferred and not re-registered or registered uh, for new vehicles or private sales. Um, and that they expect that all their citizens should uh, have those uh, excise uh, vehicles uh, undertaken. Um, tonight, we will be asking the selectmen to uh, vote on July 11th as a deadline for that. Um, Jody has indicated to me this evening that she's made great strides with the uh, two weeks of opening to get that reduced, that back backlog. Yeah, um, members of the board. So from from February, February to May, currently, I have 2,000, just a little over 2,700 registrations that are still out there that haven't been done. Um, that's a lot of progress since the 4,500 that we were originally looking at uh, way back in May. So um, between the rapid renewal, the appointment systems here at Town Hall and doing re-registrations re by mail and 
um, at through the parking lot, staff reduced that number to 2,700. Which is good news. Thank you. Um, we are, um, this is the deadline for the lodging facility advisory committee to uh, have citizens submit their applications. Um, in your packets tonight, our applicants uh, through yesterday uh, who have applied. Uh, we are proposing at our next meeting, June 16th, for you to take uh, uh, five or 10 minutes with each one to interview off camera uh, through Zoom in an executive session, and then um, begin to uh, appoint, make your appointments by the categories that you uh, determine. The, um, Beach parking lots uh, have been open the last, uh, well, last weekend for, for the first time. The weather was a little cool. Uh, we didn't see uh, problems. Uh, this weekend we'll be uh, again monitoring that uh, to see what sort of uh, activity we do have uh, there. So that's, that's it. Um. I, I'd like to propose something for the, the board to consider. Um, I was talking to John today, um, and also the other select Roach was talking to Superintendent Daly. Um, and, and I was talking to some business owners as well, and they indicated that it would help out if they could have some additional space in their parking lot for diners um, in order to free that up. Um, they were asking if we could utilize some of the government facilities parking lots for their employee parking or overflow, so that way they could, all the, the employees could um, basically, you know, park and ride together. So I, I'd like to make a motion that we, we allow um, those retail and restaurant businesses that would like to utilize um, the junior high school back parking lot, the harbor parking lot, the activity center, and the town hall parking lot on weekends, we allow them to do so for employee and overflow parking. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. In, in, um, Am I on? Oh, yeah. Okay. I thought yeah. I was muted. Uh, in our conversation uh, over the last few days with with restaurant owners, Sean and I, and um, Mr. Daly, you know, one of the things we want to make sure is that we've tried to find ways, as small or or whatever, to help out these restaurants uh, do things. And and um, so behind the junior high uh, building, there's a lot of parking. Anyone could use that for their employees um, to go, thus freeing up parking for their people because if they're taking up space with the tables and tents, that will help them uh, use that parking lot. You know, I, I think there's ways of looking at it where different areas of our town, different restaurants can use, like by splitting up the town a little bit too and how they can use it, their closest parking lot. So I think um, trying to find ways to help them is, is much more effective than some of the other things uh, out there. So I think this is this is another good thing that the selectman can do. Any comments? We have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? If not, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Thank you. Good idea, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. That leads us into good news. Sean. Over to the town manager. Do you want to give an update on your basket uh, position where things are at at this point in time? I know good things are happening, so it's certainly good news. Thank you, Sean, are you on? No. It seems to be frozen, maybe. Yeah, well, we'll get back to that. And John, uh, you have any good news for us tonight? Uh, we've had. Um, Continued uh, compliments on um, how uh, Town Hall is opening uh, and how we're serving the public. Uh, we got a quick email today. Just wanted to give you a shout out how fantastic the new portal system is. I registered our cars for the season and it was so easy. Thank you for installing it. This year was so weird in relation to our main tradition. I'm glad that this part was just a little bit easier. Thank you. Um, we have also seen the library uh, begin curbside service. Uh, 
Um, it sounds like a restaurant, but uh, <laughs> you, you go and you order your books and you go and pick them up. And uh, they come out with a bag and uh, off you go. So uh, that is happening um, uh, since yesterday and will continue. Uh, overall, the libraries throughout the state haven't really figured out how they can open up and have um, social distancing and, and uh, the guidance um, yet from the state. They haven't really uh, put one out for the library. So they remain closed, but they provide this service uh, to the public. Uh, to, uh, you, you go online and you go to the catalog system and uh, you order your books. So. Hold on a second, John, if I can interrupt you. Chris, is there something, is everybody else hearing that feedback? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Chris, is there something you can do to clear that up? I'll, uh, I'll dig into it. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. Sorry, John, go ahead if there's, you get something else. Oh, uh, maybe it's Sean's turn. Sean, are you here? Yeah. Sean, you want to give an update on your uh, basket plan? Yeah, I do. Um, so as of today, as of this second, we are up to $10,700 raised uh, in just five days of being live for ticket sales. Uh, for anyone listening now, I just posted the link to buy tickets in the, in the comment section on the Facebook Live. Um, goal would be um, to hopefully pass 11,000 by the end of this meeting. That would be, that would be a great progress. Um, we have lots of donations, lots of ticket purchases, and it's going really well. We have over 100 baskets now and about 25 live auction items. Again, the event is June 18th for Project Stimulus Wells, Maine. Um, and we are going to raffle off a lot of baskets, uh, gonna be a lot of gift cards given out, a lot of great auction items to buy. Um, the goal is to give uh, give a lot of money back to these businesses that are, are clearly hurting right now um, due to all the regulations and the pandemic. So um, really ask everyone that can and is able to to, to help out because it's a really great cause. Um, and then one other thing I saw just while we're on good news, um, on the Wells main page, uh, sometimes you can get pretty negative on there, but, but this morning I thought there was a really nice positive post. Um, there was a, a local photographer that had posted early in the morning that he was trying to he was going to sell his camera and his, and his lens and all of his equipment because he was hurting, couldn't get unemployment, and he just had no resort. So he wanted to sell the one thing you know, that seemed to, to really you know, make everyone happy on the Wells main page. He posts great pictures on there. Um, and another community member you know, talked him off the ledge, told him not to sell it. Um, there's been hundreds and hundreds of comments of people wanting to buy his artwork now, and, and he started his own Facebook page now. So I, it, was, you know, it was a really great thing to see how how awesome this community is. You know, someone wants to give up a passion um, and the whole community talked them down for it. Um, so I, I'll give them a little promo now. I mean, Jay Hopkins, check out his Facebook page. He takes beautiful pictures. Um, and it was really kind of just a heartwarming story that I read this morning that made my day, so. Outstanding. It's great when the community comes together and stories like that, that's wonderful. Any other good news from anyone else? Yeah, I just want to oh, go, go ahead. Nope, you first. All right. Age before beauty. <laughs> <laughs> At least we haven't had to kill a bee in your house tonight uh, from last <laughs> week. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, we had the one part of the graduation um, stuff last week, and that went really well. 125 out of 130 kids came, and we, we were starting to see the film come together. This Sunday, just want to remind people, uh, at 1 o'clock down Route 1, thanks to Joanne and Chief Dupree, uh, you know, we're going to be having a, a graduation parade now um, down through at one o'clock, right through uh, down all the way to a gunquit uh, down to the playhouse. It'll be a one way parade. So once they go by you, that's it. You don't have to wait for them to come back. Um, uh, you know, so that, that that's probably better for you, everyone. But if you can, it better be on the right side because we're asking the kids not to. We don't want the kids to drive because that would get a little um they're wearing their caps and gowns and they'll be waving to people and not paying attention. We don't want to see anything happen there. So go to the right side um, of the road if you can. Uh, the southbound side, I guess, is what I would say. And it'll go from the Messiah Church down to Gunkwood Playhouse on the south and, and, you know, cheer these kids on. Uh, they did a good job uh, getting through school and stuff like that, which has been challenging. So 
we hope to see everyone there. Um, I was at the school today, uh, helping pick up some books and stuff and administration was meeting. And I just think there are people like Sean said that as much as there's a lot of negativity around and I, I, I get it, but at the same time, there are people trying to help at the school today. You know, we were in talks with some of the administration, Mr. Daly about how we could help restaurants and local businesses. We were dealing with a lot of that stuff. A lot of our, um, sports teams have donated to the basket raffle. Um, and given a lot of stuff, a lot of our school stuff, uh, people have given to the basket raffle. I think people are really trying to help out. Uh, and that's really cool to see. I, you know, I know he's my son, but I got to plug him on this. I mean, their goal was 15,000. <laughs> I think they weren't going to, they thought, you know, they were hoping to reach 15,000 on June 18th. They're at 11, almost at 11,000, um, right now. And, uh, that's just unreal. And that's also the community. I mean, it's not, it's not just them, but what a great thing that's going to be. And, uh, I can't wait for the 18th. I hope to, maybe I'll win that painting behind Kathy. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> oh, I know it's another one. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> you trying to force her hand I to think, donate another one? I was trying to get another one out of her. <laughs> I don't want people to get sick of seeing that one. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I will say we just passed $11,000. I'm just, all you know, right. just five nice. minutes plugging it there. Nice. So, so keep it coming. <laughs> John, you could go now, sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, time to move on. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Uh, my understanding that um, Gary Milliard with Milliard Construction went down and graded Swamp John today, and I just wanted to give him a, a shout out and a thank you. They always do, the Milliards do very nice work, and it was good that he could get down there. And I have one. Can I just say one real quickly? Sure. Okay. Um, I want to say thank you to the Toronto family again. Um, this is the younger generation who are donating. Um, to um, a meal on Tuesday and meal on Friday for all the seniors in the senior center. Again, four more weeks. So um, it's just amazing um, how generous that family is. And I'll say thank you to them. And Kathy, I think you had mentioned a number last week. Did, how many meals have they given away during this? this oh, it's time? Well over, by now it's, it's well over 3,000. Wow, that, that's amazing. It's, it's, it's just amazing, you know, and, um, and believe me, the seniors love it. So I delivered, well, I delivered a lot. <laughs> Great. Wonderful to hear all the good stories. Keep them coming. Mm -hmm. Moving on to open to the public twice during the evening. As people know, we give people the opportunity to ask the board questions. It's uh, time for you, Brittany. All right. Uh, we'll start with the COVID-19 related questions. When can out-of-state residents come to Maine without quarantine? Is it July 1st? No. They still have to quarantine. Um, but the good news is there is great movement towards a alternate to quarantining. Um, and I believe the governor, if she's not wrapped up in other things, will make an announcement either Thursday or early next week. What about people coming in and staying in a hotel or cottage? Do they have the same restrictions? Yes. Are gatherings of more than 50 people allowed? No. More than 50. Yeah, no. Is it possible to have another extension on property taxes? No. Did I hear that the governor will make a statement about quarantine later this week? He believes she will be making an announcement. Uh, she has been working with the hospitality industry this, this week. Uh, she has uh, begun to test uh, a draft of what she wants to do uh, with the Maine Municipal Association. Uh, we have a draft of uh, what she wants to do. And um, we think she will do it this Thursday. Uh, she is preoccupied with the president coming in, um, but I, I hope she will make um, the announcement on Thursday or early next week. Can those in quarantine cheer on the graduates? Uh, no, uh, you can't be in, you can't be in public. 
when can mini golf places open? <laughs> um, I'm going to have to check on that. Um, and if that person could email me, I could try to research that. What is the town's guidance on how to handle lodging guests that become ill or show signs of COVID after arriving? Is there a contact person in town management? Do we need to report it? If so, to what agency? Do we send them home? What's the protocol? Well, the protocol is to um, call uh, the urgent care, uh, the York County urgent care in Wells. Um, they will, uh, if, if there is no uh, primary care provider for that person that they can reach, um, then urgent care would be the next best to call and let them know that you're not feeling well. Um, there is a requirement that they uh, have you come in, get tested and or looked at, and they go from there. The CDC and Maine will then be notified if, if something uh, of a COVID-19 uh, uh, test needs to be taken. Is the quarantine for 14 days or for the length of stay as of July? Well, it says um, that uh, in June, rather than, rather they can only occupy the lodging after having already been in Maine and quarantined for 14 days, as in the case of individuals who have been occupying second homes in Maine for at, la for, for at least 14 days. In other words, they have to have quarantined in Maine before they go to the lodging facility. Question and that, is, that, that is the rub here. Um, you cannot go to a hotel and just quarantine. You've got to quarantine prior to going into your lodging facility. So the governor recognizes that this is a real problem um, and is developing a alternate to, to it. Can we take drives and not get out of our vehicle while in quarantine? Um, can they ride in, in their vehicle while in quarantine? You, you, you really need to stay home unless you're traveling to see a doctor or um, something vital because what you're doing is contaminating everybody else that you come into contact with. John, didn't the governor clarify that while in quarantine you can, you can recreate, you can walk and hike? Uh, you can stay on your property and do that. Does the town have a list of places that will deliver to those of us in quarantine? If, if you're in some of the uh, campgrounds and RV parks, they, I am understanding they have a list of uh, delivery uh, services. Uh, Hannaford does some delivery, uh, but uh, they some some parks have already created a way to serve those people who are current are there to quarantine for 14 days. So I would I would check with your park managers on that. A lot of people are taking it upon themselves to enforce that people stay in quarantine. What will the town do in regards to that? If I understand the question, how are we enforcing uh, people to quarantine? Well, that's difficult because we don't know who they are, for one. And uh, we can only assume that people want to do the best and be responsible for their uh, health and others around them. I think the question was implying that there are people going around forcing out-of-staters to quarantine yeah. if they're not doing it. That's right. Um, I, I'm not aware of that. Um, we're not getting calls on that. 
Um, is Wells Urgent Care reopened? It's never been shut. It's been without the emergency doctors uh, since uh, early April, but it's open. Um, I was there today. All right, moving on to some questions about beaches. Um, what happened to setting aside spaces for resident parking? Those signs uh, are going in, but resident parking, uh, we, we haven't had a day where the parking lot has been full. Um, those signs will be up. 10% uh, of the parking is committed to people with beach stickers. And um, uh, you can, right now, it's pretty clear you can park anywhere you want. When will beach parking lot bathrooms open? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, moving on to some questions about the roads. When will Swamp John be paved? Well, uh, I guess the promo didn't work. Um, it, it's going to be a part of the town meeting vote in on July 14th. It's a one one project of six on the bond issue. Once that bond is passed, the road will be reconstructed with full drainage and um, with with a fully reconstructed road. It should last uh, many years. And you build sidewalks on Branch Road. Branch Road is a state uh, aid highway. Um, it has uh, shoulders. Um, it probably is not in a urban area high enough in volume to allow for sidewalks. When can we resurface Furbish Road in Moody? It's been bad for years. We are looking at uh, putting a um, mix on Furbish like Harbor Road um, before too many more weeks go by. Are there any land trusts targeted to wells specifically? Curious to know how conservation land can be funded other than via the town budget. Well, again, the promotion uh, video didn't do its job. Um, one of the purchases received um, um, half of the cost through a grant from the state. Um, and we, uh, the land trust, our conservation commission, has in the past gotten grants at the request of the Board of Selectmen to at least cover part of the cost, if, if not half the cost. And they've been doing a great job at doing that. John, I, I read the question a little differently. I read it as, are there any private conservation groups um, that are also working towards the same goal? I might have read that wrong, but that's how I interpret it. It's a great the Great uh, Works uh, Land Trust is one that we partner with uh, many times on, on purchases. Uh, they're based in South Berwick. Uh, they, they have a tremendous uh, uh, following and do great work. Um, and we partner with them um, as they do with other land trusts and conservation commissions in this area. When can I pick up an absentee ballot from Town Hall? You may request a absentee ballot. The ballots are at the printers and they should be in within a couple of weeks, if, if not soon. Have you given any more consideration to issuing other permits online after the success of the online Beach Pass portal? i.e. dog licenses, clamming, and others? Clam licenses would be very difficult. There's only a hundred of, of them, and it's first come, first serve. Um, and that's been a tradition um, uh, in most main towns where people line up and 
first come, first serve on that. On dog licenses, that's a great suggestion. Um, maybe our new town clerk uh, uh, following the elections, uh, that can be suggested to uh, that person. Has there ever been discussion on traffic lights on Eldridge during summer months to ease traffic and accidents when entering Route 1? Another great question. Um, the, the way that the state uh, puts in a traffic light, and it's only the state that can authorize the traffic light, is that it needs to be utilized year round. Because they take that stance, they look at the total number of vehicle turns into that road, uh, which is called the warrant. The warrant uh, does, is not met at that road or any of the beach roads uh, on a year round basis that would uh, require a traffic light. The traffic light at uh, 9A and Route 109 uh, does meet the warrant, and that is the one that's being designed and will be implemented next year. Um, are we required to pay meters in parking lots? Yes, if you don't have a beach sticker. Um, question here regarding the bonds. If when there is a reimbursement from FEMA and perhaps other federal funds, do we pay down the bond? Well, uh, let me rephrase that if I could. The bond anticipation notes are good for three years. That's a, a uh, money in, in anticipation of bonding for 10 years, uh, we're, we're going for 10 years. So what the bond anticipation note is, is a loan, if you will, uh, on the bond. And we will uh, hopefully have reimbursement by FEMA by the time we go out to bond. So if reimbursement is received, we will not need to uh, put that into the bond. So to lower the cost of the bond, lower the amount of the bond uh, going forward. For now, it looks like that's all the questions. Hey, thank you, Brittany. <clears throat> yeah, the, Carl, I just wanted to mention something real quick. Um, people, uh, calling or getting emails. If someone has a concealed weapons permit that is expiring, they can either email me or my secretary or call and we will mail those up to them so they can send it back to us and we'll do it that way. They don't have to come to the station to get the permit. They can, uh, we'll mail it to them. They can mail it back. The only time they would have to come is to sign for it when it's done. Carl, I think yep. I'm not, I'm, I just can't keep ignoring these questions about the fire department. Um, and not responding to calls. Um, it's being asked numerous times and we're not asking. So, uh, we, we'll, we are, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Selection Roach, uh, we are looking uh, at that. The, the three chiefs are looking and working together at those concerns that are being uh, out there. Uh, they are meeting um, tomorrow, in fact, and um, the resolution to that uh, issue uh, will be at hand. Thank you. I just, I don't know why we keep ignoring it though. The questions, it's been on Facebook, it's been on this, and this is the second week in a row we ignored it. Uh, is somebody being told not to ask it on air? No. It's a, it's a public person asking this question and, and it's not being a, a, asked every time. He's asked it, I think I've counted four to five times on this, on this very chat, on both chats. That's not right. I don't know if, if somebody's being asked not to ask it or we're just skipping it. Well, why, why don't you ask it? I, I did. Well, we, you have to remember a lot of those stream through. It's very hard to see them on. And I get you are saying I'm not looking at them. But thank you for bringing it up. If you guys see them that I'm being asked, I'm sure every question is not. I no, it's not. 
It's not asking you, Chief. It's, it's, I mean, every question was asked except for those. No, I think it might have this one. No other uh, selectman agrees with me. I guess I'm. No, I, 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 I do agree, and it's been asked three or four meetings now, and um, just I'm getting curious about it. I actually brought it up at the last meeting. I got you know, and actually I emailed John about it, and I, I've been curious about it myself and kind of where we're at with it because we had this conversation when I was when Sean and I first came on the board. There was a public outcry about it, and I'm just concerned that uh, these questions keep coming up. And I thought these meetings were supposed to take place around the 27th of May. So I'm just kind of curious what's going on with it. Yeah, I was under the impression that the meeting already happened where we decide what was the outcome of the fire department responding medical calls, but I guess I'm wrong. Um, for whatever reason, I, I, you guys have the ability to be able to read these things and I, I don't during the meetings, so I'm not seeing these questions, but I, I will follow up with, uh, with, uh, with what John said that three chiefs have met. I know there was a delay one week that uh, something had come up and they couldn't meet, but I believe they've met at least twice and a third time is being uh, tomorrow and that may be the fourth, I'm not sure. But behind, off, to, off camera, I've asked the question and spoken with the chiefs and I believe that progress is being made. So uh, as soon as they come together with a, with a resolution, they'll bring it to us and tell us what's going on. So what's the issue to begin with? Why aren't they going? Well, the, the issue is about protocol and the COVID um, initially on, on how the ambulance goes out and then the fire um, goes out. It's about safety of personnel initially. And um, because you don't want too many people in infected when we pull these people out of their house. Um, right. But we don't want to have somebody have a heart attack if the FD, the fire department was the quickest ones to be able to respond either. Right. It just, it seems concerning. Uh, Chief Dupuy, do you guys have enough PPE and everything to keep you guys safe? Yes, we've, um, we have plenty of masks, um, both the surgical masks, the N95 masks. We have uh, gowns, we have gloves, we have uh, face shields, and we are very much prepared and have everything we need respond appropriately. And I don't see the issue here. I don't either. I'm confused at why it's an issue, I guess. This was an issue that was discussed a while ago and it was agreed upon, signatures on the paper, that this is the way it was going to be done. And then, so it was brought up again to revisit. So we're revisiting it and we want to do it right. Um, so that's why Mark, myself, and Jimmy I'm meeting. As the town manager, I'm letting the three chiefs work it out, and we'll have a uh, resolution hopefully tomorrow. Oh, good, because this is—I agree—it's been several weeks. So, yeah. so tomorrow is there's going to there's going to be a resolution. You think? No, I don't want anybody to think that anybody's care is being yeah. compromised here because it's not. And if and that's the impression you're getting, you're getting the wrong impression. And that's not. Happening. And it's being put out also that the fire department's not going on any medical calls. Yeah. And that's not true. The fire department is going on medical calls. The only issues we're working on right now is the COVID related calls. And that's it. And, you know, we've met two times. We're going to meet tomorrow. It's about safety for the public, but it's also about safety for our employees. Okay. So the fire department is going on medical calls. They're, we're talking about the COVID calls. So, so I just want to. I just want to clarify. So you're saying that the fire department's going to medical calls unless it's a COVID call. The, we have a, a response plan with the fire department that was agreed on when Chief Beatry was here. Uh, Mark and Chief Putnam and I are talking about that, looking at that again. But yeah, we came up at the beginning of the COVID. How do we reduce the footprint? How do we reduce the exposure to personnel? Um, some calls we only have one person going in just to make sure it's, it's, it's safe for each um, person to go in, to try to limit the exposure. That's changing now as the science comes around, we're looking at it again. The fire department is going on call. EMS calls across the state of Maine are down 30%. We're not going on EMS calls. So I'm not sure why everybody's keen on the fire department's not going. Well, EMS isn't going. You know, it was told to me that we didn't send the fire department on a cardiac arrest call. And I said, when? And they couldn't tell me when. They haven't had a cardiac arrest, knock on wood, in Wells in six or eight months or longer. 
So there's a lot of stuff going on. I urge anybody to contact me or the fire chief or the police chief instead of putting all this stuff on social media. Uh, my office is open to anybody. I have email. I have a phone. Um, my number's been put out there on social media. Give me a call. I urge the selectmen to call me if they'd like to also. But but I don't think we need to call you. We should have this discussion right here. I, I don't understand why we why this has to be a private discussion. I, I think the discussion should happen right here, right now. You just said that there's no, I'm not trying to accuse you or anything, but you said there's the fire department's going on anything that's not COVID related. Is that no, correct? No, the fire department does not go on every EMS call. The, just like the EMS service does not go on every fire call. If, if Meme needs to be lifted up because she fell, we don't need to send you know, everybody to that. It, it's, a, it's a specific uh, response plan that Chief Vitri and Chief Putnam and I put together. Now that we have a new fire chief, we're looking at it again. We are working towards going back to 2017, 18, 18 uh, uh, agreement. And that's uh, what's on the table right now and how, how we can enhance that. I don't think the concern was with the number of calls. I think it was with response times to calls. So what's our average response time for the, at the outer reaches of Wells right now we for EMS calls? I don't have that information right now. We we can get that, but it's yeah, not, no, I'm not. I'm not saying it needs to be right now. I just I'm just curious. It's not that long. It's pretty. We have good response times. Both police fire and the EMS all of us have good response times. But I guess my my concern. I, I was the one that brought it up years ago, and I, I I guess I'm being accused of saying that I don't think you should go on calls. I asked a question a year or so ago about how that worked. Um, I guess I just don't understand what a, what a, and no, please chief, if we don't take offense to this, how I say this, it's not meant that way, but are the firemen that busy? They, they can't go. I mean, well, we are in full and all of the firefighters are, uh, are ready to proceed. As a matter of fact, they're chomping at the bit to get back out there and to start serving the public. We believe that this is the best interest in the public's uh, health and safety. And uh, we don't have, of course, we understand the concerns for COVID-19, but we are firefighters. We're, uh, it's our job to be responding to these things. We're following national standards. EMS, the main EMS licensing uh, requires that COVID-19 calls are not to be reduced. And also that, um, quite honestly, I would love to be in agreement um, with WEMS. I would love to be in agreement with all the departments, but at the end, the main EMS system requires that the only one that's in charge of how the fire department responds is the fire chief. And at some point, I need to get back to the way we were responding before. I was hoping I could get an agreement, um, but in the end, ultimately, that's gonna be my choice to, to make and to go back. And I'd like to do that as soon as possible. Actually, there's just one other thing about what uh, the fire chief said. The uh, main EMS rules and laws state that the non-transporting and the transporting agency need to be in agreement. That's why initially we came up, and this response plan came up long before my time, but we've, we've looked at it over the years, we've enacted it. I'll take the blame on, on reducing the response for the COVID because I honestly thought that that was the right thing to do. There's nine full-time firefighters. If one of them gets exposed, they all get exposed. I, I'll take that hit. That was my idea. I thought we were following the national standards. The non-transporting and the transporting agency have to agree on a response plan. That's what made it, it is not an absolute requirement. As a matter of fact, the main EMS has told me that it is in the best interest to continue to respond to calls. And if you can't get into an agreement, that is another issue altogether. However, we need to be responding to EMS calls again to make sure that we are treating the public the way they should be and that we're giving them the best results that possible to be able to respond to medical calls. And unfortunately, I just feel like this has been a very difficult um, thing to get through. Um, we just wanna go back to doing the way things were. Um, I think that's the important thing. We are looking for the best interest of the public to be able to give them the medical service that they should expect. Um, we would, we are going to be happy to do whatever we need to do with personal protective equipment and all that stuff. So we would like to go back to doing our job. 
And Jim, I, you know, I think everybody that's sitting here is aware that at the onset of this, we agreed with you, you brought that to us. And I don't think there was a single one of us who disagreed. My thing is at this point, we just hired Chief Dupuis to do this job. And he's telling us that he thinks that it's prudent that his guys start responding. Um, I, I have to agree. We were elected by the public to oversee this stuff. And we have a responsibility to the public. I don't think it wise to take highly trained professionals out of the equation. If we need them, we need them. And, um, you know, as, as from what I know, those guys down there, highly educated in their field, very professional. So I, I just think that we're really, you know, selling ourselves as a community short by reducing the amount that they respond. So especially if they can keep themselves safe from the COVID-19, which was the original concern anyway. Yeah, I have two questions on that. Um, one question is, what are other towns doing? Are they responding with firemen? And two, um, take away the COVID, which I know you can't right now, but I, I get What's the other, re why, why can't they respond? I mean, I guess I'm not understanding why they can't respond. If there was no COVID, would they be responding to everything? Yeah. No, no. The agreement is that they respond to certain life-threatening emergencies. Again, if MMA falls down, do you want all your emergency agencies responding? That's the thing. It, it, this whole change came about, and I know Chris Mooney, and I know Nat Pierce, and they're union firefighters in a gun club. And I'm a retired union firefighter. I'm not saying their opinions are wrong, but they're union firefighters in a gun club. Well, yeah, so but Chris is also a taxpayer in the town of Wells. And they, his, his opinion and his knowledge of the field, I think he brings something unique. So as far as Chris's opinion is concerned, I completely respect it. And the fact that he's being singled out here, I, I don't really appreciate that at all, uh, actually. You, you didn't let me finish, John. You didn't let me finish. You missed the part where I said, I'm a retired union firefighter, and I understand the need to do the job and want to do the job. But the three of us have met three, well, three times tomorrow just to iron this out. I still have grave concerns about the COVID stuff. But chief, uh, the fire chief says that that's not an issue or a concern. They have all the equipment they need now, and that's fine. And we're going to resolve this tomorrow. Also, right before the meeting today, I was on the phone with Maine EMS and got some information that I need to pass on to both. I haven't had a chance to pass on to the fire chief and uh, Director Lapola. So there's uh, it's still moving parts here. We're trying to do it right. We don't want to rush into this and do it the wrong way. We're going to do it the right way. Like, you know, and I can tell you, I have the, um, the health and everything of the community here at heart. I'm not, I don't want to compromise anybody never have never will and i don't and i think it's important to do it right though we don't want to be revisiting this again correct i just don't do it right and get it done and that's what we're trying to do that's why i personally called the ms main ems today and spoke with them and uh was enlightened by some of the stuff that i got today that other people not said so i'm going to share that with the two of them tomorrow and hopefully we can resolve this yeah and I, some of it, I think, um, and maybe some of these are, may come across as comments, and maybe that's why, they, I don't know specific questions, I'm not looking at it, and there's no reason to, if the, the questions are out there asked, we got nothing to hide, never have, never will, so. It's, um, it's more of a coordination basis. Now, if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, fire departments that run ambulances, uh, there's a much easier coordination there. Uh, MedQ, as part of the Portland Fire Department, they have a coordination. The ambulance goes out. An engine doesn't go out every time a, a call for service comes. Um, so there's three moving parts in, in, in the uh, town of Wells. One is the fire department, one is WIMS, and the police department. And right. so. It, it's a coordination basis, which uh, I'm hoping three professional people can work out tomorrow and, and either go back to the uh, 2018 agreement um, or, or come up with a different agreement that, that works. That's our goal. Yeah, that, that's always a hope. I, I, I guess I, I don't understand people getting angry over asking questions that are asked to us. 
by our taxpayers. They're not asked by, I don't, I don't even know these two people that you mentioned. So I, I don't know if I've ever met them in my life, but if I have, I apologize to them, but I, it, they're questions that are coming up to us on, on the, on both sides, on the chat over here on this. And I think they have to be asked. I don't think we can just ignore it and, and bury our heads in the sand on this stuff. We, and it's important for us to know what's going on. That it, I have no idea you have three meetings. I, you know, these are things we don't know. Nobody's informing us of that. We've well, talked about it for three weeks, but nobody's told us there's three meetings. Well, last week when John asked the question, we said we met, we, I think we're meeting the next day, if I remember right. You did say you were meeting the next no, day. I missed that, sorry, sorry but I but I think I would hope this would have been solved in one meeting, not three uh, meetings. I think the important thing is it's working on, and they're working on it to solve it. Yes, we are. And to solve it. <clears throat> Some of the, you know, the background on this, this goes back, and I don't know how many years, I guess I've served too many at this point, but at one point in time, taxpayers were questioning the board in regards to the equipment we were sending on calls because yes. and, and so we were getting the other side of this equation that so much equipment on the road, it was becoming a hazard to get around. I remember it came to the board and we decided we'll leave hands of the professionals who do this stuff to work it out. Mm -hmm. I concur with the fact that, right. that, you know, three, three people can get together in a room and it's out because I don't have firefighter training, EMS training or police officer training. And I, we, we didn't want to start talking about changing dispatch and getting involved with making the wrong call because, you know, if the board of selectmen decided, what call anybody was going to go on or who, who and how they were going to respond. We, we took the position that we'd make the wrong decision. So it's, it was back then left to be up to the WEMS director, the fire chief and the police chief to figure this out. And I think they're making progress. And I would hope that uh, the information we get back tomorrow is that there's been a resolution to this. I'd like to see them lock themselves in the room until they come out with an answer. Be like, oh. <laughs> You got to put black smoke up to let us know there's an answer. I'm fine with that even too, but just lock yourselves in and come out with an answer because this shouldn't go much longer, please. Thank you. Any other questions that haven't been asked that need to be asked? Because again, I don't have that in front of me. I, I can't. That was the only one I saw. That, I, that a few more came in. Will the arcade be open this summer? <laughs> yes. Yes. We, uh, uh, the question was asked last week. We uh, he has pulled his uh, permit, uh, business license, and uh, I think he'll be open. Did we did we ask the one that the reimbursement from FEMA will it buy down the bond? Did we ask yes. that? Yes. Uh, I, um, I answered it. Maybe it didn't make sense, but yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Are yard sales currently allowed? Yes. Okay. All right. That was it. Any other questions from the board before we move on? Mm -mm. Be back open to the public again and later on. So we'll just take care of some business here, which is current agenda items. With action on accounts payable and payroll warrants. John. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. We have two warrants this evening. The, the treasurer's warrant dated June 2nd, 2020. The warrant of $232,047.03. Two pay periods since we last met. First pay period dated May 21st. Uh, net $84,225.77. The second pay period dated uh, May 28th. Uh, net $91,804.19. Withholding for those two periods, $72,000. $170.24. Total expense $480,247.23. Questions on the warrant? I move, to, I move to approve and sign the warrant dated June 2nd, 2020, and the amount of $480,247.23. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero, thank you. Second uh, uh, warrant, special uh, warrant this evening uh, is uh, a, a expenditure for We Are Wells Fund from the We Are Wells Fund of $1,200. 
I move to approve and sign the warrant dated June 2nd, 2020 in the amount of $1,200. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero, thank you. Good to hear that it's going to good use out there. Next item is update discussion and action on committees, projects, issues, purchases, and personnel. The first being a discussion and action on requiring delinquent wells vehicle re-registrations or new private sale vehicle registrations to be excised completely and done by July 11th, 2020 for, for the months of February through June 2020 per the governor's order 53-A. Yeah. Uh, the governor came out with an order last week to amend her order 53 to put a uh, requirement that municipal officers of the municipality uh, give reasonable notice to the public of the start date of the municipal, municipality's ability to collect taxes and process registrations and a deadline for compliance by vehicle owners. So uh, we have given notice that on um, May 18th, we reopened town hall. Uh, now she's requiring us to give a delinquent um, date in time. And we are doing the furthest extension of that possible. Uh, and we're recommending to the board July 11th. So that includes the ones that, uh, that, um, that are due by the end of this month? Yes. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay, Kat. I move to accept the date of July 11th as the deadline for delinquent vehicle registrations from February through June for the town of Wells to meet the governor's order 53-A. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero again, thank you. Next item is discussion and action on updates, personnel and committee assignments, resignations and issues town manager or the selection uh, selection so we're going to move on to accepting donations and bequests there's one this evening sixty dollars from Lindsay Strug, Caitlin Kelly, Allison Barton, the Wells Harbor Community Park in memory of Nay Young. I move that we accept the generous donation and write a letter of thanks to the donor. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Next is discussion and action on approving the minutes of the May 26, 2020 Selectman's meeting. Any corrections or changes need to be addressed? Yep. Approval of the May 26, 2020 Selectman's meeting minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero again, thank you. At the new business, we are back open to the public. Brittany, do you have any further questions at this time? Just a few more. Um, I think we already went over this, but they came up again. How many firemen do we have? Nine full-time firefighters. Chief, do you want to answer that? Yes, we have nine full-time firefighters. We have three shifts of three firefighters. A captain on, a sh on each shift with two firefighters per shift. So... Three on duty each day. And Chief, I know you answered this. Uh, how many calls do we have like available if we had to? Um, we have a we have eight. We have eight call firefighters. Eight. Did they go up? I'm sorry. I thought I thought last time it was only six. I thought, oh wow, did it go up? <laughs> um, no, it's been eight for a little while. Um, oh, okay. Good. Um, oh, sorry. Another question here, I'm not sure I understand it, but I'm going to read it just so I'm covering everything. Why is the public way now being kept? The, uh, the public ways on Atlantic Avenue currently um, on the main access point from Eastern Shore parking lot, it's still blocked off. We believe those uh, eggs of the plovers will hatch within a week to 10 days. Once they have uh, the uh, Audubon Society believes the whole family will move down to uh, the beach area so that they can uh, have a food supply. 
once they do that, we'll open up that right away, put the matting down, and it will be open. Um, right away 13 and 14 are open. Uh, we have uh, sprayed those areas with ticks. And um, so I think I've answered uh, that question. We just got a little bit of clarification. Um, why is Public Way 4 specifically not being kept up? Well, I think we talked about that last month. Um, I believe right away four is the uh, a driveway to a deeded driveway to a house. Um, what we have said we would do is to put um, the same material that is in half of the uh, right away all the way down to the seawall, which is uh, taking out the live sand or adding uh, materials to the live sand to toughen it up. That's everything for new questions. Any questions from the board or anyone else at this point in time? Moving on then to the town manager's report, John. Um, I just wanted to bring up um, in, in my update um, to the board, I've been working with a company, a startup company, uh, that uh, is looking at doing uh, parking lot reservations. Um, didn't know if there was any feedback from the board on that. Yeah, I'd like to get more info on that. It sounded like an interesting uh, system that could be used to make it more efficient. It, it would be a pilot on one or two uh, parking lots. Um, the concern I had was enough time to market it and make it clear uh to people out there um you know the, traffic yeah i had the only concern i had was how uh, savvy does somebody have to be to be able to do that because some people can you know i'm just worried about some of the people that go down there that expect it to be the way it is and then all of a sudden there's no there's no openings because everybody got ahead of time and got reservations like uh fast passes that's some of the things that you get so um, I'm just concerned about that. Well, that's, that's one, one concern I had was enough time to promote it. Um, the time to do it is like in January, like we were gonna do on so many other things. Uh, but uh, clearly if, if you took um, a promotional uh, piece and tied it in with people getting their beach stickers and uh, put it in the tax bills, and making people aware uh, that in order to use the parking lots, you need to make a reservation. Um, I, I don't know. I, John, I, my biggest concern is that because it sounds like a really good idea, it always sounds more efficient, but I can tell you if you book um, a vacation here in January, um, can you call ahead? I mean, can you reserve it? I'm saying how far ahead? So that all of a sudden when somebody that lives here goes down to you go there, everything is booked and reserved because somebody has done it four, min four months before that. That's all I'm asking is that if, if we can look at that and make sure that isn't going to happen, um, uh, then that's a really good way to do it. But we, I, guess I think you could just set up. It. Yeah. I think you could just set up some spots so that you, you say X amount of capacity is, is reserved for, for basically what we'll call walk-ins and then you could do, you know, other set percentages can be reserved because it's what most cities use these days for all their parking garages and parking. It's it's very common and very easy. Um, but if you had a set amount set for for basically drive up and park with you know no reservation required for these X amount of spots, I think that could be a nice compromise if we looked further into this. I, I don't mind looking at it. I I I worry somewhat like Kathy about how, yeah. you know, people understanding it. But the other part I would I would ask about is like like anything, I guess people reserve and do, do they pay when they reserve and then if they don't yeah. show up, I, I want to make sure those spots get used even though they paid, which is a good thing for us, we get more revenue. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but you know, those are things I worry. I would love to hear who's done it, like who's done it for beach parking, like who, what other towns have actually tried this. I'd like to hear that and, and, and look at it. I mean, you could take one of the parking lots and try it, like just to see what it looks like. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I, I think it's late right now. I, I, I think we need to look at it maybe for, 
if we're going to do this, it'd be next summer. I don't, yeah, right I now it's, summer. it's already June and, and you know, I mean, and I, we're already, we already said we're talking about next summer. All right. Summer. Thank you. I guess I miss stuff all the time now. I, I really get cold. <laughs> Everything just flies over just my head. <laughs> <laughs> the concern that I have with it and, you know, I, obviously this is not a, a service that's free. And if we're going to steer something, uh, how do we do this if there's no competitive bidding and how much money is going to be taken out? So I don't know anything about the, this, this entity or whatever, but uh, if we're going to make changes like this, that's going to cost money uh, fair and equitable to other companies yeah. would need to be a bid process. And if there's only one company out there doing it, I'm concerned about that. Uh, yeah. And I saw that the price I thought was pretty pricey, you know, for what, you know, they're going to do when, or when do we really need that? Do we have that many, um, it, it, are we big enough? Are we, you know, is it that important to do that? When are we, are we fixing when it ain't broke? Well, what it does do is uh, it creates the ability for someone in Wells who has a tough time getting a parking space to get a reservation and be able to park uh, when they go down. Um, but I have a folder started for my replacement and this can go right in there. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I think at this point in time, John, we, we need, we have more questions than, than answers. So maybe yeah. that needs to grow a little bit and we'll look at it later. Right. Anything else? Not for me. If there's nothing else from the board, uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I make a motion, we adjourn. I second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Have a good Aye. night. Zero. Thank you. Thank you, stay well, Thank stay you everybody. Take care. Yep. Take care, everybody. Good night. Good night.